Good afternoon. digital technologies to support TNACR um, delivery of um, protection um, activities to um, refugees and migrants uh, around the world. Uh, my name is Erika Perez Iglesias. I'm part of ENHCR um, Innovation Service outposted in Panama, working under the Digital Inclusion Program. Um, with me, um, I have today a Operational decision making, and yeah, I think my connection is a little bit spotty. Sorry, this is Panama office. Um, so um. Erica, if you can hear me, um, you can turn your camera off or your video um, off. It could um, help the voice if the connection is not too great. Great, thank you. So perhaps I also ask for the support of my colleague Catherine uh, Schneider to share the presentation as my connection is a bit unstable, if that's okay with her. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, just, just over to, to Arturo to perhaps um, introduce himself and start with this presentation. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone who is uh, participating in the, in the streaming video. It's a pleasure for, for us uh, and, and for myself to participate in, in this workshop and also on behalf of the Brazil operation. So what we are going to present is one of the of the projects that we are developing in terms of innovation in the UNHR operation in Brazil. So basically, my name is Arturo Neves. I'm a senior field coordinator with UNHR in the north of Brazil in an operation which is mostly focused on the arrival of uh, Venezuelan refugees and migrants. So uh, I'm based in Roraima, which is the uh, yes, please next slide. Thank you. Um, so I'm based in Roraima, which is the, the, the state in the north of Brazil, uh, bordering Venezuela. And uh, in Roraima, we have two offices. One is Boavista, where I'm based, and is the capital of the state. And the other one is Pacaraima. And Pacaraima is a very small town right by the border with uh, Venezuela. So we have Santa Elena on the Venezuelan side, and then we have Pacaraima on the Brazilian side. And that, that is the, the main entry point for the Venezuelan refugees and migrants who are entering Brazil every day. Uh, and, and from Boa Vista, where I'm based, we organize all the operations related to this uh, entry of uh, asylum seekers and, and, and people asking for temporary residence because it's a mix, a mix a flow of refugees and migrants. Um, next slide. Next slide. Next one. Next one. Yeah, so this, uh, this will help with my explanation. So I'm based here in Boa Vista, is the office right in the north. And then you will see a small, a small place, Pacaraima, that is the border with, with Venezuela. So this state in the north is Roraima, the capital of the state is Boa Vista, where we are based. And then UNHCR in Brazil, we have offices in other places. We have branch office in Brasilia, then we have an office in Sao Paulo, and we have an office in Belém and in Manaus. So, um, this is more or less the, the structure that we have. Uh, I'm, I'm coordinating operations in the, in, the, in the north. So basically dealing with the, with the influx of refugees and migrants. 
And uh, as UNHCR, we support Brazil's federal government in the management of the Venezuela situation. So the federal government in Brazil established an operation at the federal level. This is called Operation Welcome. In Portuguese, it's Operação Acolhida. And uh, this is a, a federal response to the influx of refugees and migrants because the, the state government was not being able to deal with, uh, with such a big influx of, uh, of refugees and migrants. Just uh, for, for you to have a, an idea, uh, the, the historical average of entries through Pacaraima is 544 people per day, even though this has a high variation. So we have periods where the daily entries are more than double this, uh, this number of 544. We have periods where the entries are a little bit uh, lower, but that is, a, that is the average. Um, right now, we are kind of in a weird situation because the border has been closed for many months following the, the COVID pandemic. And on 23rd June, the Brazilian border more or less reopened, but the Venezuelan border is still closed. So um, the, the calculations on the number of entries now are tricky. And that is one of the main reasons what, why we are also uh, doing this, this project on predict, predictive analytics of, of entries, because we have many people entering Brazil through the irregular routes, and those are difficult to quantify. But for you to have an idea, we are, we are talking about this average of 544 people per day. We believe now this is a little bit higher, around 700 people per day. And that is the, the, the influx that we have, the steady influx that we have into Brazil. Uh, Operation Welcome, which is the federal government's uh, response to the, to the situation, is headquartered in, in Boa Vista, Roraima. And uh, what the federal government did was organizing a structure, which is called the Emergency Committee for, for dealing with the operation, which is based in, in Brasilia. And this is a, a joint effort of 12 ministries in Brazil. So these 12 ministries um, are coordinated by Casa Civil, which is one of the, of the ministries. Um, Casa Civil is more or less the Ministry of the Presidency would be more or less the, the, the equivalent of the Ministry of the, of the Presidency and in other countries. But in the field, the, the response is coordinated by the Brazilian Army. So the Brazilian Army is headquartered in, in Boa Vista, and they have a, a, a humanitarian logistics task force uh, commanded by a, by a division general, uh, currently division general Swingle, and uh, the, the army here is our main counterpart when it comes to organizing the operations uh, for, the, for, the, for the influx, right? Together with other UN agencies and of course NGOs, uh, civil society organizations and other partners. So UNHCR is a key actor within Operation Welcome. Uh, we have presence in Boa Vista since 2017, in Pacaraima since 2018, and in Manaus uh, is an old it's an old field office that uh, now has been more focused on, on Operation Welcome, but it's open since 2007. So the three pillars of the operation, of the Brazilian federal government operation, uh, are basically documentation and border control, then humanitarian assistance, which is a focus on, on providing shelter to vulnerable populations, and then a program on voluntary relocation that they call uh, in interiorization, meaning that they, they, the idea is to take people from Boa Vista, which is one of the uh, less developed states within Brazil, to other areas within Brazil where integration is, is, uh, is more feasible, is easier. Um, just a, a general comment on, on this, what I would say is that one of the differences, one of the peculiarities of the Brazil operation, when we see other operations that, that UNHCR has in other places of the world, is that here in Brazil, we don't have refugee camps. In Brazil, we have temporary shelters because the main focus of the operation is integration. So we have small shelters that are uh, in, uh, mainly in urban areas to facilitate integration and to facilitate the, the socioeconomic life of, of the refugees and migrants living within the shelters. Uh, and, and then uh, we have a, a whole line of, of work focused on livelihoods and durable solutions, because as I said, the, the focus of the operation is integration within Brazil, not necessarily in Roraima, but in other states uh, uh, all over the country. And, uh, and, and so the idea is to have 
a high rotation in the temporary shelter so that people are not spending a lot of time in the shelters because the idea is for them to continue their way and to uh, be fully integrated and, and restart the, their lives in Brazil. Next slide. So I will be briefly uh, commenting on the three pillars of the operation and the, and the way we support each one of them. So on documentation and border control, <coughs> we have teams uh, right in the border. The, the, there is a facility, uh, which is a, a facility where the government is based, the army is based, all UN agencies are based, and also some NGOs is right by the border. And uh, what we do is supporting refugees and migrants with all the documentation information. And we also support them to do the, the asylum requests, uh, uh, other UN agencies, uh, in particular, the International Organization for Migration, they do the support for the temporary residents. And then we have uh, also UNICEF taking uh, also uh, care of the, of the children in the space and, and providing some services for unaccompanied minors and so on. We have uh, UNFPA, I mean, and so on and so forth. But this facility is right in the border of the, in the, in the Brazilian border with Venezuela is the main entry point so uh, the refugees will come in and then they go to they go to the to this facility which is called the Petrige and we have a, a, a series of services to provide documentation also working hand in hand with the federal police who are the ones uh, with the authority to 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 issue the documents uh, we also do border monitoring and and and, and support to the vulnerable cases that are coming in through the uh, through the through the official entry or through other irregular routes, because that is a, a, a also a steady reality. We have a constant influx of people crossing through the uh, irregular pathways. So next slide. Oh, and by the way, peaceful coexistence is, is also a very a very key issue. Uh, as as you may know, if if you are familiar with the context. We had some uh, protests, quite heavy protests, back in, in 2017, uh, right before the operation was established. And, and so peaceful coexistence is a main uh, part of our work, uh, particularly in Pacaraima, which is a very small town, but also in Boavista and other places. So the second pillar of the operation, which is sheltering and humanitarian assistance, uh, UNHCR, we are mandated with the coordination and management of all camps uh, in, in the operation, thanks to an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, that we have signed with the Ministry of Citizenship. The Ministry of Citizenship is the authority to, to, to deal with humanitarian assistance, and they have requested UNHCR to take care of the, of the camp coordination and camp management, and we have agreed, and so we manage all the shelter spaces. These numbers uh, change regularly because we need to adapt to the to the influx of entries and, and to the and, and also the the, the exits uh, through the voluntary relocation program or other projects for integration. So these numbers currently are slightly higher than that. We have currently capacity to shelter more than ten thousand people in in Roraima, which is the which is the the highest uh, number of people that we are man able to to shelter in Roraima since the beginning of the operation. Then, of course, we do other things, including the distribution of non food items. We provide cash based assistance, cash cash based interventions for some particular cases. Uh, and, and then we do all sorts of uh, information management tools to coordinate with partners and with the government for them to be able to, to know what is uh, the situation in, in the shelters in Roraima. Next slide. Uh, the third pillar, finally, is the voluntary relocation program. This is called, uh, in Portuguese, interiorisa sound, which is a made up word because it literally means interiorization. And, and, and the logic of that is, uh, you know, organizing uh, basically flights with the Brazilian armed forces, and and also through uh, cooperation agreements with uh, with airlines, and this is a joint effort by many partners in the in the operation to be able to voluntarily relocate uh, persons of concern to other states in Brazil where inter where, where integration is easier or might be easier than in Roraima. UNHCR, we are leading one of the modalities of this uh, program, which is called the institutional modality, and it's focused on the on the people who are particularly vulnerable and whose integration is is really really hard. Like uh, for instance, a um, couple of months ago, we we made a, a 
a partnership with a municipality in the south of Brazil, uh, close to Rio de Janeiro, where we were able to relocate a group of elders who had been in Boa Vista for more than two years and whose integration was extremely hard. So we made a um, uh, yeah, uh, so we made a, an agreement to make this uh, possible. Sorry, I'm talking too much. So next slide. Response to COVID, yeah, I will I will just briefly mention mm, the, the COVID pandemic hit us on March 13, March 2020, and then we organized a full response, including a contingency plan specific to COVID with 700 pages, and we built a hospital, a new hospital, among other efforts. Then we can go into detail if, if you have more questions, but next slide, because otherwise my colleagues will not be able to talk. Um, this is a, one of the main issues of the operation. We support the drafting of the government's contingency plan. This is in case, this is to plan for a, for a contingency where the, the influx of refugees is higher, is much higher than expected, right? So uh, I, I was telling you that uh, we have a regular entry of 544. What would happen if this was 2,000 per day? So we need to prepare for that in terms of sheltering, in terms of organizing the, the response and so on. This is a, a, a plan that is active and, and renovated every year. So we are now starting to work on the new version of the continuity plan for 2022. And this is one of the key products that uh, is part of our partnership with UN Global Pulse. Uh, and, and the, the, the reason why we are doing this presentation today, which is the predictive model to see how can we predict uh, more accurately the number of entries that we will have in Brazil. And so for the first time um, in, in the history of the operation, and I think it's also quite uh, new in, 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 the, in the region, we were able to include in the government's contingency plan a predictive model that was developed in partnership with the UNHR Innovation and UN Global Pulse. So this has been extremely useful and it's been very useful also to plan and to organize uh, the response and, and also to uh, draft the contingency plan. Uh, then my colleagues will go into detail into the into the technicalities of the of the of the model, but uh, this is a extremely useful for planning purposes, extremely useful for advocacy purposes, because this is uh, something that we use when we want to advocate with the, with the Brazilian armed forces to reshuffle the shelters or, or to do changes in the operation. And also with the ministries, we have, a, a, as I said, we, had a, we have an MOU with the Ministry of Citizenship and we work regularly with other ministries. So the predictive model gives us information of what's going to happen. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not uh, exact science, but at least we have uh, something better than guesstimation, which is uh, the, the, the usual way of uh, doing these things. And now we are in a position of uh, planning and organizing with uh, more data and, and based on facts and, and, and based on, on, on tools that are uh, you know improving as we have more data because uh, as as we keep registry of the data of entries then we are able to improve the the tools and, and the tools are getting better and better and better and we strongly believe that this is the way of doing contingency planning in the future and and we see this as the beginning of a new way of doing things in terms of contingency planning and operations planning when it comes to a uh, influx of, of uh, refugees no? next slide um yeah, I mean, this is uh, briefly what I wanted to say. The, the border has been closed for a while. Then the Brazilian border reopened in uh, on, on 23rd June. And, and now we are waiting for the Venezuelan border to reopen. And so we are uh, in close liaison with our colleagues from Global Pulse and, and, and UNHR Innovation to uh, have 
the best understanding as that, that we can in terms of what's going to happen so that we can plan in advance a, a situation that is going to be challenging because the, uh, the, the, the situation in Venezuela, unfortunately, is, uh, does not seem to, to get better. And um, in, in the operation in Brazil, we also have uh, our, our challenges and, 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 uh, and our difficulties. Uh, so we need to predict as much as we can so that we can plan and advocate with institutions and, and authorities to reduce the impact of an increased influx of refugees and migrants. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So I will hand over to Catherine, who will take over from here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Arturo. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, in case you missed the introduction, I'm Catherine with the Innovation Service um, based out of Geneva. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we incorporated the innovation process into this uh, project and how we're continuing to use it. Um, so it's really, the innovation process is really important for how we approach things um, that entail our assumptions. So with this project specifically, as Arturo mentioned, UNHCR Brazil had a humanitarian challenge around the resource allocation, the shelter capacity, and how they could advocate within Brazil for Venezuelan migrants arriving. Um, but there was also a challenge that was related to data. You know, we're in COVID, and I think I can speak for everyone when I say all of our behaviors really changed as the world changed uh, as we knew it. Um, so we were trying to find a way to reconcile both the challenge identified by the field and the data challenge of how people are going to change their behaviors, how persons of concern will potentially move or not move, depending on how COVID uh, impacts their decision-making behaviors. Um, so where innovation really came in is to kind of try to coordinate all of those issues and to put them under one umbrella to address them with a multitude of people um, in order to feed into evidence-based decision-making. Um, and this is because the solution is not necessarily technical, although it's a predictive analytics project, it really requires a lot of coordination, thinking about different models, testing it, challenging our own assumptions about how people would behave and incorporating social science, engineering, um, data science all together to kind of understand one big umbrella. Um, we really wanted to focus this on bringing together both Global Pulse, UNHCR Brazil and innovation because we wanted to have a continuous feedback process. This means not only testing our models and making sure that they were reflecting a reality that was being seen on the ground by our field colleagues, but also having that kind of continuous feedback about, are these models updated? Are they intuitive? Are the modelers getting data at a periodic regularity that makes it easier for them to update those models automatically? And um, because it is quite a team effort in order to build something like this that is usable from both the technical standpoint and from kind of the, the you know, policy advocacy standpoint. Um, innovation also tries to, to straddle different worlds. Um, they try to bring a little bit of technical expertise. We have in-house you know, modelers from our side, but also bringing in this idea of, you know, in background in social science, in research, kind of having connections within academia, the private sector and humanitarianism, because all of those perspectives and expertises are really necessary in order to build a viable product. Um, and lastly, we really wanted this uh, evidence-based uh, you know, solution to really be driven from the field. So we really always try at UNHCR when building kind of any data innovation project to put persons of concern at the center of the solution. And if possible, we really want to consult them before we even start building. Um, and obviously with COVID that made it quite challenging. We weren't able to go to Brazil. We weren't able to, you know, maybe do focus groups in a way that we might've been able to before, but we were really thankful for our, our colleagues in UNHCR Brazil because we were able to include questions in the, that we were, were linked to our assumptions that would feed into this predictive analytics project. Um, within their regular protection monitoring surveys. So these kinds of questions are asking about their motivations to leave, what they did before they leave. These are all things that help us understand behavioral uh, choices that are made prior to maybe going into Brazil. And so all of that fed into this process and it's a continuous process for all of us to kind of continue to work together. Um, we have regular meetings and we really wanna make sure that these products are adapting to changing context because in a humanitarian crisis, they're never kind of static. Um, oops. 
Um, but modeling in computational social science is quite challenging. Um, it takes a couple different things and puts them all together into one big model. Um, so some of that is a public digital footprint. So this might be, you know, uh, data that's available on social media networks from, through public APIs. It could be, can, uh, you know, when you click, I consent to these cookies, those kinds of digital footprints we leave across the web. That's one part of it. We also have humanitarian data, which Arturo uh, kind of highlighted in his slide. So the, the kind of data that we're already collecting on numbers of arrivals, and these are traditionally just normal humanitarian data collection methods. Um, and lastly, we have other kind of socioeconomic variables. These can be things like GDP, but they can also be uh, data that comes from development actors or partners of ours in the region. And all of this data kind of feeds together to be reformatted and processed in order to build a model that just kind of abstracts uh, some kind of representation of how we think people will behave. Um, but the, the problem with these things, not necessarily a problem, but the, the, the caveat to these products is that you have to know that they are inherently limited by who is producing some of this data, who is included in this data. So with uh, data sets like anything coming from Facebook, for instance, or internet you know, connectivity, that requires an internet connection. A lot of times for social media, it requires you have a certain age in order to access that, it requires that you're active on a social media platform. So those kinds of things can bias a data set. So maybe it's not a rep fully representative uh, model of all behaviors of everyone who is fleeing or is arriving into uh, Brazil. So this is just something to keep in mind that when we're building these kinds of uh, predictive analytics models, they are not a panacea. They are just yet another tool that we can provide that can be helpful, but it can also be um, limited and have its own kind of limitations when we're trying to operationalize it. And just, you know, this might seem kind of wild and science fiction-y to come from a UN agency to build predictive analytics projects, but this isn't actually the first time that UNHCR has ever done this. We've actually built a lot of predictive analytics tools in the past, um, and we really wanted to take some of those lessons learned in order to kind of further our predictive analytics work. We've worked both with field operations and UN Global Pulse quite closely in the past. Um, we had UNHCR Winter Cell, which was their first case of predictive analytics in 2015, which was for the European Mediterranean crisis. And then we also built a uh, project Jetson in Somalia with the help of UN Global Pulse again and the Somalia operation. And that was, and neither of those were really to uh, feed into anticipatory human, humanitarian action, but was to help us understand different movements and what we call the push pull factors or the, the predictors of how people were moving and when they would choose to move. And this is all very important because there will be different kind of indicators in different contexts that can actually give you a good idea if people in a certain town or a certain region are getting ready to flee or not flee. So those kinds of things of learning, not, learning how to discern what those motivating factors are and then how to build products around that is actually very helpful. This is our first case of really using this for humanitarian action that's anticipatory. Um, and, you know, we have UNHCR Brazil using this evidence to help inform decision making, but we also make sure that there are things like uh, algorithmic accountability. So when we produce a model and that maybe changes some kind of reaction to it, we know exactly where in the model they've seen that information. And if it's incorrect, we can go back and rectify that issue. So it's not happening in a black box. It's a constant communication between UNHCR Brazil and the modelers from both Global Pulse and Innovation. So this is an ongoing process, um, but it is something that we have some experience in. And with that, I will pass it over to Catherine hoffman fan from UN Global Pulse to explain a bit more on the technicality. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll just give a brief uh, overview of the contingency planning tools. And in particular, we like to think of this as a suite of three different experiments. Um, next slide, please. Um, so globally, I guess, you know, when we think about the contingency planning process, we imagine that there's sort of, a, you know, several stages that occur. So first is that the operation will acquire some data about what's happening on the ground and then consider possible scenarios about what might happen in the future. Um, from there, they might identify actions that they want to take based on those scenarios. And then the question really becomes, you know, how can we assess the current situation relative to the scenarios and then plan for, you know, scenarios that might emerge in the future. And so the tool that we're offering is basically combining three different um, phases of intervention. The first is this is a simulation. 
So when the operation is considering these scenarios, we allow them to experiment with different possibilities. So we have a, a simulation tool that allows them to say, okay, you know, we expect a certain number of people coming across the border and a certain percent of those will need shelter. Um, and under these different conditions, we can start to estimate how quickly shelter capacity will be filled and how quickly we might have to activate a phase of the contingency plan. The second component then is also just a, you know, sort of a now casting component where we actually try to gather data on um, crossings and on potential drivers of the demand for shelter. So for example, we might want to estimate people that are currently in Santa Elena who are preparing to cross over into Brazil. Um, and again, sort of tracking the situation in real time so that we might know, you know what, what is currently happening. The third um, sort of component of this toolkit is then this predictive analytics tool that's actually forecasting rivals in the future. Um, but again, we sort of think of this as a holistic um, set of tools because, you know, based on different predictions, we may want to go back to the simulation and see what might happen under these different ranges that we're predicting. Um, so together, this sort of suite of tools allows a, sort of a, um, a comprehensive view of the, of the different um, possible situations that might emerge. Next slide, please. So I'll start uh, briefly with just explaining a little bit on experiment one, which is the simulation for our shelter capacity. Next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, at the moment that we, we initiated the project, there was just a lot of uncertainty around expected arrivals. So there was, you know, a normal state of the world that had existed prior to COVID. Um, and then with the border closure, it wasn't clear exactly like both how many people would cross informally during the closure and then how many people would cross once the border will hypothetically be reopened. For, currently it's reopened from the Brazil side, but not from the Venezuela side. So we still don't know exactly what's gonna happen. Um, and so what we wanted to allow um, the operation to do is ask, you know, under these different assumptions about things that might happen, uh, what, you know, how will we activate the contingency plan and then how long will it take to actually reach phases of the, of the plan? Next slide, please. So essentially, in order to prepare for this, we started to document different assumptions about how many people might arrive per day, how fast the operation could register them, um, what fraction of them would actually be requesting spaces in the shelters. And we also found that from within Brazil, people were presenting and asking for shelter. So even if they weren't recorded crossing the border, they might have crossed informally and then from within Brazil needed assistance. Uh, we also gathered data on existing shelter capacity as well as the capacity of the operation to relocate people, um, which again has sort of been dependent on the policy situation in COVID that it's not as easy to relocate people during, during this period as it has been in the past. And then the broader framework that we're plugging into, again, is this Kalida. So this idea that we have these different contingency plans that will be activated under different settings, um, and each phase has sort of a trigger. So once the shelter reaches a certain level of capacity, there's a step that's taken to you know, vacate additional spaces or to construct additional, additional shelter capacity. Next slide, please. And so what we really, we started to do is sort of actually map out the process of what happens to a person that's crossing the border. So we imagine that people at first sit in this state of wanting to leave. Next slide, please. Um, and then at some point they decide they're actually going to take the, the, the step to move to the border. And once they're at the border, then they'll be formally processed um, and documented if they cross through the, the formal crossing. Next slide, please. From there, they have three different options, right? So one is that they might just proceed independently. They might have family in Brazil already, or they might have a plan of what they want to do. The second is that they might need some other sort of assistance from UNHCR, but not necessarily shelter. And then the third is that they enter these shelters, so these abrigos. And then once they're in the shelter, they can they can be relocated out at a certain rate into other parts of Brazil. This is the interiorization strategy um, that Arturo had explained. One complicating factor, again, is that people can come informally across the border, so they're never registered or processed uh, until they appear in Brazil, and then they're joining the shelters. Um, so we had to add an additional channel into the sort of flowchart to allow for that informal movement, um, which now is, is sort of representing a larger and larger share since last January, a larger and larger share of the crossings. Next slide, please. So what we wound up with was this shelter capacity model that you can see here. So the operation can basically slide the um, these different uh, sliders with different assumptions. And based on those assumptions, we start to see what kind of capacity we expect, both like at the border, in the shelters, and then who have already been relocated. And they can advance through time to see over time how these numbers are changing. So you can start to see where there's going to be bottlenecks developing, right? So if you, if you can put people into the shelters, but you can't relocate them, then you start to see the pressure on the shelters building up. And so, you know, either... Um, you know, you can you can basically need to start relocating people faster, or you need to expand the capacity that's available within the shelters. So this is sort of the the first the first step in the in this sort of toolkit, which is just allowing again, you know, from any speculation, any idea about what might, what might happen, you can sort of experiment and, and see sort of at what point how this will affect the shelters. The second component is really this now casting effort to actually understand, you know, what what's happening currently on the ground on the Venezuela side, and what how do we expect the different drivers of migration to be changing over time? Next slide, please. 
Um, and again, so this is a question of what's currently happening, who is planning to cross, are they already on their way to the border, are they already, you know, even in Boa Vista and Pacaraima, but maybe not known to the operation because they haven't requested any assistance. Um, and so, you know, we've gathered like a pretty wide range of different data sets on these topics. So in terms of asking who's planning to leave, we have data on conflict from ACLID, so um, like protest incidents, um, and we've categorized those by themes such as like fuel um, or like working conditions, medical um, supplies. Uh, we have uh, data from Google, both on their mobility reports. So they have been during the pandemic me measuring how people are moving to different venues um, over time. So this is sort of capturing effect of lockdowns and people's own like self-censorship and decision, you know, not to move because they're scared of the pandemic. Um, we have Google search trends. So we look for searches on the border between uh, Brazil and Venezuela, um, as well as searches for like Torchas, which is the name for the informal channels that they're crossing through. Um, we have data on COVID case counts and symptoms, um, and then economic indicators like oil prices, um, exchange rates, and the consumer price index. Then in terms of capturing people that are actually on their way to the border, we are looking a lot at social media. So we have um, you know, a, an approach to sort of parsing Twitter. Um, the operation has also identified some Facebook groups that might have relevant discussions. Um, we actually were able to start capturing a radio station to get local discussion. And then we sort of considered satellite data. Um, to date, we're not really using that um, just because of the, the image quality. It was like sort of difficult to, to, to leverage it, but that's also you know, in other humanitarian situations would be, would be a resource that's available. And then finally, in on the Brazil side, um, we have the protection monitoring data that the operation is collecting um, and other surveys run from UNHCR and its partners. IOM is producing estimates as well. And then we are trying to gather some Facebook audience estimates of the number of people that are formerly expats from Venezuela who are currently in Brazil, um, on the Brazil side. Um, so yeah, so we, we essentially are sort of aggregating all these different data sets and integrating them and so that we can sort of have this holistic view of the situation. So yeah, so just a simple example, you know, in terms of conflict and protests, we can uh, sort of count here. I'm showing the number of different protests around fuel and gas. So you can see that during the pandemic, this is really, these types of conflicts have really uh, escalated. Um, you can see the COVID case data over time, so you can determine sort of when there's a surge. Next slide, please. Um, we, we can see, yeah, so for radio stations, you can have sort of opinions and context, even, you know, like call-in discussions. Um, and uh, for satellite data, again, we are sort of trying to look at and see if we can actually see, you know, uh, people building up along the route. Um, but it's been quite difficult with cloud cloud coverage um, and within frequency of the satellite images. And then for Twitter, again, we have these sort of social listening tools, so we can sort of track these insights over time and particularly drive down into individual stories. If we see a tweet that there's, you know, some some sort of group of people or some sort of problem that's occurring, we can sort of flag that for the operation. Ideally, they would have seen it independently, but in case there's anything that they miss, we can sort of do this automatically through the, the tools that we have. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and as I said, sort of with Google, we can sort of track mobility data over time. So for example, you can see that visits to sort of grocery and pharmacy venues has like really gone up this year, but that like, tr you know, transport venues is still uh, quite depressed. So this is again, giving some insight into like how, how people are changing their patterns um, under the pandemic. Um, and in terms of search trends, again, this is a search for sort of these informal crossings um, and you can sort of see the spikes in volume over time. And yeah, finally, in terms of um, in terms of uh, Facebook data, we can again sort of gather. So so Facebook will sort of estimate uh, based on people's behavior who is an expat living in another country. And again, we can sort of get those specific um, estimates for different cities in Brazil, such as Boa Vista, and over time track the number of people that Facebook is estimating to sort of identify how these populations might be changing. So as Catherine said, these platforms are obviously problematic because not everyone's represented on Facebook, and because the you know it's not entirely transparent how Facebook is estimating these numbers. But it's another indicator that we can use to flag what might be a potentially concerning change if we see a large increase in the number of expat Brazilians, uh, expat Venezuelans that are being reported in, in Brazil. And again, we can also look at these border towns and try to see how the population of the border towns is changing over time. So as um, Arturo said, Santa Elena and Pagarayma are relatively small towns. And so we can see if there's an influx of people that should um, sort of be an anomaly. And so then the third um, experiment is really sort of assessing these future scenarios. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, we want to know if the border remains closed, what will be the demand for shelter? So there's still people that are crossing informally. Um, currently, people are allowed into Brazil, though they're not technically supposed to be leaving Venezuela, but so people are still showing up and requesting protection. And then we also have um, people that have been in Brazil possibly for a long time, um, but are emerging to, to request support. Um, and then there's this question of once the border is fully open and, and sort of mobility is, is returned to normal, then how many people will cross? Next slide, please. 
So um, yes, the idea again is to sort of do this with an eye to the contingency and scenario planning so that we can inform those, those types of decisions. So assessing the likelihood of different scenarios and also factors that might predict arrivals according to these models. Um, and so, you know, we sort of decided that we're focused on predicting sort of daily arrivals up to one month in advance um, and using this really wide range of predictors, you know, some of the data sources that I've already highlighted. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so as I said, we have sort of political, social, health, economic, and seasonal variables. Um, so the seasonal ones I haven't really discussed yet, but it's kind of interesting. We're looking at bus schedules for people traveling to the border, as well as school holidays, because it looks like families are sort of planning around um, these sort of annual um, leave in order to, to make the, the move. Um, at least based on historical data. And then um, we've sort of been changing over time the actual variable that we're trying to predict. So initially we were using pre-COVID data and we were trying to predict the daily crossings. Now we're looking at actually uh, shelter registrations in progress um, and po possibly the permisos that the Brazilian government is issuing to Venezuelans that have crossed. Um, so the dependent variable has sort of changed over time depending on the, the situation. So we imagine that, um, you know, these informal crossings will continue and are worth predicting even separately from the question of what happens once the border fully reopens. Next slide, please. So essentially, um, you know, the, the broader predictive analytics or approach that we're taking is that we sort of have this training and validation data where we identify the trend that we want to predict and gather these data on the different predictors and build models that relate the two. Next slide, please. Then we have sort of testing data. So once we formulate these predictions, we have a period of time that we that hasn't where we haven't seen the uh, the models haven't seen this data before, but we make a prediction with the model and assess how these models are doing and sort of pick the best ones. Next slide, please. And then the final are sort of, um, so we can use that to evaluate the quality of the models. And then the third is this, again, unseen data that the model can use to make forecasts. Um, so in this case, um, we are predicting what's gonna happen in the future. And we've sort of developed a, um, an approach to adding prediction intervals that can illustrate uncertainty around the forecasts that we're making, um, again, so that we can sort of keep these bounds and you know, understand that the models aren't gonna be 100% accurate, that we still need to sort of um, you know, build in the, all these unknowables that are, that are sort of inherent to the structure of the data. Next slide, please. So one, you know, I'll, I'll sort of highlight, you know, the reason why we sort of wound up with this broader three-part approach with the simulation tool and the now casting is, is largely that there's like a lot of challenges to prediction in this context. I should say not this context in any humanitarian context. Um, so in all of these predictive analytics discussions, you know, on the one hand, you in this case, we had a very unusual circumstance around COVID-19. So people's past behavior might not be representative of how they're currently or planning to behave. Um, and we might also see some trends that are sort of ir very regular in the COVID pandemic, which makes it harder to feed them into the models, right? Because they're quite different than what we had been recording before. Um, we also had a lot of missing information. So there's a lot of uncertainties and errors in the data reporting. Um, so there's some people that we're just missing altogether. They never report to UNHCR. They're never recorded in a formal crossing. Um, we have, you know, potential manipulation of the data on the Venezuelan side. It's not clear how accurate their COVID case data is. Um, and so it's very difficult both to validate the inputs to the model and the outputs of the model. So we try to use a really diverse range of data sources so they have the most holistic view possible, but understand that any individual data source will definitely be flawed. Um, and then in terms of um, you know, deployment, I think there's a, a question about how we can really communicate these model outputs for, for effective use. So right now the operation is using these um, for advocacy purposes, but you know, the idea is that there are many different users that might want you know, sort of different applications. And so we're trying to think about how do we design a tool that can like talk to each of these different needs. You know, some people want to actually see um, you know, the, the raw data and, and do the analysis themselves. Some people might need to see a summary. Some people you know, need a spreadsheet that they can take to a meeting with a government official or something like that. So there are all these different possible use cases and we want to sort of define with that in mind. The next slide, please. So I think we just wanted to conclude briefly, and maybe then we can open up to questions with a you know sort of a discussion of the lessons learned and the and the next steps. So I'll turn it back over to Arturo to to share on that. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So uh, as as we were saying before, the the tool is is proved to be very, very useful in, in different areas. One is preparedness, and, and that is mainly, uh, that's probably the main one. The tool has already been used in contingency planning. So we uh, include the results of the tool when it comes to uh, reshuffle the, the shelters or um, change the shelter capacity or uh, design the, the, the new phases of the voluntary relocation program and so on and so forth. So it's extremely useful in terms of preparedness and planning. Then advocacy, that is, uh, that is also one of the, one of the benefits of, of the tool for us particularly with the army, because that the army is our main counterpart when it comes to drafting the, the contingency plan. 
so we have an evidence evidence based um, tool that is uh, helping us to design the different scenarios of the contingency plan and the different triggers and so on. Not only with the army, also with the different ministries, in particular with, with the Ministry of Citizenship, when it comes to decide uh, what is going to happen with the with the shelters in the short and the medium uh, term. So, and other ministries, of course, and, and also uh, when we have a uh, visits uh, of, of other kind, like, uh, for example, last week was here the European Commission and we're explaining the operation, how do we use the, the, this tool to predict uh, arrivals and to, and to plan the operation. And, uh, and that, is, that, is a, that is part of, of our work now. And, and, and as I said, uh, we think that, that this is the, the way forward and we want to strengthen uh, this, uh, this and, and other related tools because this is the way uh, ahead, and, and this is the, the the way to plan and, and to uh, and to design the operation. Cooperation, reinforce collaboration between teams with different skills and competencies. I mean, it's it's, it's been great to have this uh, partnership with UNHR Innovation and uh, um, UN Global Pulse because uh, we all have our own areas of expertise. And uh, for sure, when we uh, strengthen our collaboration, then uh, we can do better projects because uh, we can contribute from our all different areas of, of expertise. Uh, innovation, yes, UNHCR uh, has uh, is, is an innovative way by aggregating, analyzing it, discovering new patterns in the data, and so on. Basically, what we were doing before was using the historical averages. Right to to more or less estimate what what is going to happen in the in the short term. But now this is a this is a this is something more sophisticated and and uh, and this is part of an overall innovation strategy that we have in Brazil operation that is comprehensive of other projects uh, from shelter to um, to greening the the operation to reduce the environmental impact. I mean we have a. a wider array of, of, of actions and of projects related to innovation because we want to constantly improve and, and uh, ensure the protection of our persons of concern and, and, and in this case, the Venezuelan refugees and migrants. So I think those are the main highlights uh, that, we can, that we can say that the tool is already contributing with and, uh, and, and making us believe that this is definitely the way the way forward. I, I know that we're almost out of time, so just really quickly we'll run through this and then hand the floor back to our moderator, Erica. Um, but you know, just from the AI and kind of data science side, Catherine and I can really speak to the the importance of like the significant time commitment it takes to build one of these products, not just consulting with the the operation and their partners on the ground in Brazil, but also with you know, persons of concern through like like the traditional kind of surveys that are being given by humanitarian organizations and using that to inform our assumptions and predictors. Um, we also, you know, having that strong operational context is really important in humanitarian crises, especially as they shift so rapidly and in the times of COVID where we're experiencing kind of an unprecedented environment in which we're all operating and are very restricted um, in terms of what we can do and who how we can travel and operate. Um, we're all quite spread out, but you know we've done our best to really make sure that the, the operation is at the heart of this, and they're able to really drive things forward. Um, and lastly, you know, a project like this really benefits from the broad investment in capacity building and knowledge sharing, like we're doing now, but also within all of our you know different field operations within UNHCR more broadly and within you and Global Pulse. All of this kind of work is not meant to sit here entirely, but it's meant to be shared and so we can all learn from it and we can hopefully inform future predictive analytics projects that are principled and uh, based in ethics and human rights in the future. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to our moderator. Thank you so much, both Catherine and Arturo. Loads of uh, information here to digest for, for our audience. We quickly see a question from uh, from the chat, so from the participants, which is related um, to why are you working in this project from outside the country and especially why there are not collaboration with local and regional academia and government um, such as IBGE, IPEI, or even the regional ministry or even IMASON or MAP Biomas? 
And I think this is related to the previous question. Yeah, why and how you're collaborating with MDR, MoveLAM, Map Biomass, IAMazon, or official data providers. Um, no mention to local academy involvement in, in the project. So perhaps um, Arturo could start addressing this question since he's uh, our representative from the field. Over to you, Arturo, and then perhaps both Catherines can complement when needed. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very good question. And, and, and the answer is we do have partnerships with most of, of these institutions. We have a strong partnerships with the Universidad Federal de Joraima, which is the federal university here in the state, and other academic institutions. We have uh, a regular partnership with uh, many universities throughout Brazil and other countries in the Catedra uh, Sergio Vieira de Melo, which is a comprehensive, a comprehensive uh, partnership with uh, academia. And we for sure have strong links with the IBGE and other data related institutions in Brazil. The reason why we are doing this uh, particular project with, uh, with uh, UNHCR Innovation and Global Pulse was to benefit from the previous experience that we had uh, in, other, in other regions. And, and then before Catherine was mentioning the example of uh, Somalia and Europe and, and so on. So we wanted to benefit from that experience and also from the expertise that uh, we have in terms of uh, AI, in terms of, uh, of the UN system. But uh, I, just to make sure that it's clear that we do have these partnerships uh, in other innovation related projects with uh, the institution, most of the institutions mentioned in the question and other institutions. We also have projects with uh, Alto University in Europe. We have uh, uh, partnerships with, uh, with the Dutch Relief uh, Service and so on. So we are trying to gather as much expertise as we can also locally, of course, to uh, ensure the protection of, of refugees, which is our mandate. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I, I can sort of just follow up again, as, as Arturo said, we're trying to sort of transfer some of the knowledge that we had developed uh, trying to do similar projects in Somalia, which is why there's sort of been global involvement in this, um, not just at the local level, but I, I, I think that, you know, the idea will be that each, you know, sort of field operation could then have like, you know, the, the, the model like uh, at the local level and, and integrate that type of expertise and those types of modifications, because, you know, we found even trying to use what we had in Somalia and, and bring it into the, the Brazilian case um, was not very effective. We had to basically start from scratch. We learned, you know, how to collect the data and how to think about structuring the indicators, but at the end of the day, the context is so different that um, that even the models look look quite differently. Um, I think the other you know the other challenge with in terms of data sources, I think we're pretty open to incorporating whatever is available. I think we we started with indicators focusing on the Venezuelan side because we really wanted to understand what you know what's driving people to to leave. Um, so we haven't has, had as much focus on like Brazilian statistics. Um, the the primary challenge that we found using official statistics is that the frequency is is um, quite low. So it's they tend to be you know quarterly at, at best um, or maybe infrequent survey rounds. Um, whereas we're trying to get you know indicators at the daily or the weekly level, generally speaking, um, and so that sort of hindered us from from incorporating some of those sources in a formal way. But you know at the same time we can sort of look at them and compare our results. You know compare the broader trends, the information we're getting about why people leave and how many of them are coming and what they look like. You know those are all things that we've used to sort of inform the the broader development of the of the project. So you know I don't I don't think that we've converged on a final set of data sources. We can continue to incorporate you know any source of like high frequency, high quality data that we can we can find. Thank you both Arturo and, and Catherine. Um, we received a second question um, on the accuracy rates of the predictive models, if we are able to share um, some insights. So I don't know if perhaps um, Catherine Hoffman um, could take this one. Sure. Yeah, at the moment, you can see that I'm not actually putting up the predictions, and that's because we're undergoing a change. So we had, as I said, we had previously been predicting on 2018 uh, data, like under pre-COVID times, um, and now we sort of tried to switch to predicting informal crossings. Um, but the time series that we have is is relatively limited. Um, so in particular, from the uh, from the Brazilian side, the border has only been open since June, and so we're training on a very limited data set. 
So right now we're, we're predicting, um, but we're not placing a lot of faith in those predictions. And we're trying to like enhance the, the models more before we're like fully sort of deploying them. So I'm hoping that um, we'll soon have some results on that. But at the moment, we're proceeding pretty cautiously, again, sort of focusing on this broader suite of tools, just because there's so much uncertainty around those around those data and statistics. Um, and even in the process on the UNHCR side of registering people, that also takes time. And, you know, the data is continually being updated. And so um, I think it's still going to be a little bit a little bit of a ways to go before we feel confident in sort of um, putting Thanks, Gus, Catherine. And we are mindful of time. So perhaps um, two final questions uh, from my side that are related to the scalability of this project and the ability to perhaps replicate it or adapt it or tailor better to other operational contexts. And also, if you were starting the project today, uh, with the knowledge and experiences that you have, what would you do different in Brazil? So I don't know who would like to take that. I guess it's a collective group question. Maybe Arturo, you want to start and then and Catherine and I can add? Break the ice, please. Well, um... This is, a, this is by definition a work in progress because the, the models are constantly improving themselves. I mean, with the support of, of our colleagues, but the, the idea is to feed more data and, and so we will have better and better projects. So this is the beginning of a new methodology, of a new way of doing things. This is part of uh, the innovation approach that we are taking to be more efficient. And uh, this is the way forward. Um, for sure, COVID was disruptive, and it was also disruptive of the uh, efforts that we were doing on the on the predictive analytics side. Because when the pandemic started, then we needed to readapt the way that we were uh, formulating the models because the the whole uh, structure of the arrivals changed. Then and, and then the the borders closed, and then we had an increase in the irregular entries and so on. So. Um, but, but, but you know, uh, what can we do? Uh, so we, we still want to continue and, and also to learn uh, because it's also an experiment, right? To see what's, uh, what kind of changes do we have when we have a situation when both borders uh, close at the same time, then one border is open, the other is closed. And then we are able to also see trends. So the idea is to gather as much data as we can so that in the future, we are able to have better and better models that are you know, taking over the old way of doing things. And this is uh, more professional and, and more evidence-based. And, and this is the, the future of contingency planning and, and not only. In, uh, that's, that's, that's what I would say. So you know, I, I think that in, in a few years, this would be mainstream to, to other operations as well. Yeah, I mean, I can I can add quickly that this is sort of something that we're thinking a lot about at Global Pulse, trying to develop some of this uh, capacity. I think, um, you know, in general, there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, enthusiasm around predictive analytics, but I think there's still a long way to go for the space to sort of converge on best practices, um, share lessons learned. You know, I, I think that that the conversation is starting now, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about like how to do this well. Um, and I think we're we're trying to develop that capacity as quickly as possible through doing projects like this. Um, but, you know, so we're, we're starting to think about how can we, you know, structure these types of problems, how do you translate from one context to another, um, and so that's that's definitely a priority um, for, for work, uh, you know, in the, in the near future. And I think I'll just add quickly to end up from the innovation side, just, you know, not something I'd necessarily change, but like the importance of collaboration as Erica, or as Catherine kind of mentioned of like, we're learning our best practices and what is really promising for this field, but also learning like what that kind of collaboration needs to look like, how consistent it needs to be, where those like health checks need to be when you're building these kinds of products to make sure that they suit everybody's need, because it, it is different depending on if you're building the models or if you're using the models for advocacy or to inform your decision making. So I think always having those, those health checkpoints together and those moments of cooperation are really important um, as we continue to see predictive analytics in the humanitarian sector. Thank you so much to both the panelists and the participants to join us today. 
um, hopefully all the sharings and, and learnings that uh, we'll be presenting to you will be useful and some food for thought. Um, hopefully this is the beginning of many of these projects that will support um, operational decision making on the ground and like future like forward thinking um, to make a disruption in the humanitarian um, planning purposes. So with this, I don't think we have more uh, questions from um, from participants. So we would like to wrap up this session. Uh, thank you very much and have a nice day. Continue um, attending the other interesting uh, sessions of this conference. So have a good day. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.